almost 100. Yeah, see, um, they missed the good part, but they're not going to feel the jolt like you will. Huh? Um, and we have a close to, I think, 40 something folks um, on the virtual side. So, you know, we're getting we're getting uh, used to used to I used to be used to people all being in one place and then physically together and then got used to people being in no place and virtual together. And so now we're working like all of you are doing it, figuring out how to operate in this hybrid environment. So we'll get good at that. Um, boat is almost 100 years old. It was a ferry boat, active ferry boat for 50 years. It was the headquarters of two companies for the next 50 years, uh, most recently in Stockton. Uh, we bought it in 2020, in 2020 and spent the next two and a half years uh, re gutting and fixing her up and turning it into the headquarters of the Bay Area Council, negotiating leases with the port of San Francisco and more agencies to get a ship like this with an office on the water than you could ever imagine. Um, and it's been, it's been quite a, an experience, but you know, hopefully a real a addition to San Francisco and the region. Uh, so it's exciting in that way. Um, I will, uh, let's talk about, we're here to talk about higher education, which is a really, really, obviously a really critical subject. And um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists. We're gonna you know, go through a conversation and then we wanna have audience participation. So there will be ample time for you to ask questions, whether you're here in the room with us or uh, in the in virtual land. And you know, it's, this isn't meant to be really uh, formal, you know, it's meant, it really is to be a, a friendly conversation about the current state and the future of, of uh, higher education. So uh, let's talk a little bit about California as a way of framing this. Uh, our state has the, the largest array of public higher education in the United States with 10 U University of California campuses, 23 California State University campuses, and 116 community colleges throughout the state. Uh, with more, you know, well over 2 million students. The community college system itself has about 1.8 million students, making it the largest uh, single public higher education system in the country. Uh, so we're, we definitely uh, win when it comes to size, uh, but how do we do in other ways? Uh, we, as I think you know, most of the folks in this room are, you know, come from the institution of higher education or attached to it. So you know that we face a lot of different challenges. Uh, affordability of ed education, equity gaps, especially for Black and Latino students. Uh, more recently, community college enrollment rates have seen uh, an actual decline since we got into the pandemic, which uh, is uh, difficult. Uh, we, you know, the, you know, there are existential pressures on the system with uh, really new de demands from the work, you know, the, uh, from companies. Uh, private and public institutions, organizations uh, for high tech workers with very specialized skills. Uh, we're in an era of automation, we're in an era of upskilling and reskilling. Um, and then the whole question of the remote work and remote learning, which is very, very new. And I think we're all experiencing uh, the ups and downs of that. Uh, so the big question is, are we teaching uh, what, uh, what needs to be taught uh, for the jobs of today, the jobs of tomorrow, and uh, are we doing a good are we doing a good job of it? So to answer those questions and others, we shall pose, uh, and you shall pose. Uh, I'm I'm excited to welcome two uh, really incredible leaders in higher ed in California and the country. Eloy Oakley is president and CEO of the College Futures Foundation, and Ajita Tallwalker Menon, who's president and CEO of Calbright College. Uh, Eloy is a lifelong champion of equitable student opportunity. Before joining the College Futures Foundation, he served as chancellor of the California Community Colleges, a senior higher education advisor to U.S. Secretary of Education, and a member of the University of California Board of Regents. So welcome, Eloy. And Ajita Tallwalker Menon has dedicated her career to driving better and more equitable outcomes in higher ed and workforce training. Prior to coming to California, she served in the Obama administration as special assistant to the president for higher ed policy at the White House Domestic Policy Council, held senior positions at the US Department of Education, and more recently worked as a senior advisor to the chancellor of the California Community Colleges. So thank you, why don't you come on up, Ajita and Eloy, for, and thanks for being here. And um, you know, I think I'll just ask you each to start off uh, 
answering the, you know, the basic question, you know, I'll, I'll ask what, what keeps you, uh, what, you know, you, you're involved in so many aspects of higher ed, what, what keeps you up uh, at night? What's really on your mind? Ajito, I'll start with you. And speak right into the mic because that's how our virtual audience will hear us. I know it's a little weird. How about now? Oh. <laughs> uh, honestly, the thing that keeps me up at night is uh, whether we will take our focus away from what we are knowing and learning is, the, is what we should be learning coming out of this pandemic and coming out of the decades of um, gap that we're seeing in terms of the, um, the uh, economic and social uh, gaps uh, facing our country. And, and that focus has to be on understanding how we adapt our institutions and our programmatic offerings and our services in ways that are designed around the needs of learners. And the learners look very differently than they looked a couple decades ago. The demographic composition of higher ed has changed and the realities facing those who need higher ed to be an access point in order to stabilize their income, stabilize the situation in their families um, has become more urgent than it ever has been. And um, so, so my, my thing that keeps me up at night is making sure we're gonna rise to the occasion uh, as a state and as a country. Great, we'll talk uh, more about that. Eloy, what's on your uh, mind? Uh, so what keeps me up at night, besides uh, terrible pitching choices on behalf of the Dodgers front office, um, which has not allowed me to sleep the last several days, but um, beyond that, um, what keeps me up at night is um, uh, the, the changes the rapid changes happening in the workforce and in and around higher education and whether or not our public systems will be able to adapt uh, with them uh, along the way. Uh, we see a huge demand for some type of post-secondary credential for all Americans of all backgrounds, uh, particularly those Americans who have not always had the greatest access to um, education in this country. And you, you see this being manifested in the anger that you feel across the country. There are people who feel that they're completely disconnected, whether in reality or not, from the economy. Um, and so that's what keeps me up at night, this, this growing divide that um, in, in many cases is linked to the fact that um, our higher education institutions have become so selective um, that the majority of Americans don't feel like they can participate anymore. And that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I think that's a, a pervasive issue. So you, you both mentioned the changes that are, that are taking place that are pushing the, putting the pressures on the system. So what, what trends do you see taking place in higher education to, to address those things? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start with actually what I'd like to see, you know, hashtag trending in higher ed, which is, uh, again, um, really understanding what the evidence is telling us, what our students are telling us are their needs, their desires uh, in higher education, right? They are voting with their feet in terms of preferences, not out of vanity, but out of necessity. And, you know, when I think about some of the students that attend Calvert College, you know, I think of a, uh, one of one of our students, Alana, she moved from Hawaii to California, and she couldn't afford to continue her post secondary education so she had to drop out. She was working a series of dead end short term jobs, and she couldn't make ends meet. Where was the opportunity going to be for her? She was able to, we were able to reach her. She was able to enroll in our IT support program. And then within the span of eight months, she was able to complete the program, get her A plus certification, which is a gateway credential for the IT support work. And she was able to get a job and a raise. And that is a transformative experience for somebody. And um, unfortunately in higher ed, we're finding that's more the exception than the norm. And it happens because we become so institutionally focused on the systems that exist and the policies that exist that it is hard for us to break out and look at it from the perspective of students like Ilana. 
how, does, how do we provide more opportunities to cater our offerings, our objectives, our experience, right? The actual educational experience uh, to the needs of Alana. And that's more and bigger than just do things go online. It is very much about curating the necessary support from the journey end to end. And so what I am starting to hear in more of the conversations that I'm in uh, is an orientation towards this. And you know that's a big deal. A few years ago, folks in higher ed were not even focused on outcomes, right? It, it took a while for us to even believe that we had to care about what happened to a student after they fell out of our institution. And now for a, a whole host of factors, including the way that higher ed is financed on the, on the, on the backs of student debt, um, institutions have been paying more attention to it. And when you take this moment, which is a deep set of profound enrollment drops that we are seeing at a time during economic recovery where we should be seeing students flocking back to higher education, um, the trending thing is, is trying to figure out how do we get students back, how do we keep them, and how do we honor the throughput that we need to facilitate for them? Thanks, Ajita. So, you know, Eloy, uh, more or less same question. What do you see as some of the trends? And then I'll let Ajita's comment lead to the next question, which is, uh, so talk about the enrollment situation. I think it's maybe a 20% drop in the community colleges since 2019. So. Uh, you know, what do you see happening and, you know, why are we seeing this level of, uh, is it disinterest or inability to focus or function? What's, what's going on? So, first of all, what, what's exciting is, you know, things like Calbright College, um, which I think has come just at the right time for the California Community Colleges. Um, you know, we're actually talking about how do we more personalize the education for individuals not just open the doors and expect people to fit into the mold that we have traditionally expected and fit into on the hours that we expect them to fit into um, and on the calendar that we expect for them. Um, and so that leads me to your, to your other question, which is what's going on? Well, what's going on is you know, students have pretty much had it with traditional higher education. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated that. Um, they've gotten a taste of what it means to be remote. Uh, they want more of that. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is there was an enrollment decline before the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated the enrollment decline. So there was more and more questions about the value proposition of why am I going into a two, three, four, five year program? What's the return on my investment? Um, so there's a lot of questioning. And by the way, the enrollment decline in California isn't unique. There's an enrollment decline across the entire country that we saw happening uh, several years ago. Uh, and this is also true of, of regional publics. This is true of nonprofits. You see a lot of our private nonprofit institution, our independents closing their doors. Uh, Mills College is an example here, Marymount down in Southern California. So the business model is broken. The lack of attention to adjusting to people's schedules is part of the problem and students questioning the value proposition uh, more and more going forward. Thank you. So you mentioned the innovation that is, that is Calbright. And uh, you know, to be on the record, the Bay Area Council has been a supporter of Calbright since its inception. From day one. That's From right. day one, right? <laughs> but it wasn't always easy, right, Ajita? Because Calbright has, uh, you know, you know, had, let's say, moments of ups and downs uh, and a lot of pressure, a lot of criticism from the legislature, audits done, um, fingers pointed, bills promoted. So far, so good. We've been able to, uh, I think, hold our own. But um, what do you, you know, t talk about Calbright. I, I assume most folks know about it, but some may not. Talk about Calbright. What's, what's behind the theory of Calbright? How's it going? You know, what do you see as, you know, sort of more recent developments there and you know, what we can what can we expect yeah um i would say i, I start out by describing calbright calbright college as like 
the lead on the learning curve uh, for serving this population of learners. And it was through the insight and the wisdom and you know, the modesty, because Eloy didn't say this, but of you know, Eloy, then Governor Brown, and now Governor Newsom, and, and several champions in the legislature, understanding that this needed to happen in California. And it needed to happen because of a reflection and a recognition of what was happening to people in our communities that wasn't solved by the traditional system. And so even though there will always likely be naysayers, because anytime you disrupt something in the conventional way of doing things, and anytime you upset native constituencies that benefit from the structural design of a traditional uh, college setting, you are gonna be met with resistance. And um, I think the important thing for me is always going to be not just the champions and the leadership and the folks like Jim and Eloy, um, that keep our focus on doing what is necessary, doing what is right. Um, it is also because we have to quiet the naysayers that will always be there. And we need to focus on listening to the voices that resonate most with us. And at the college, whether it's in you know, the virtual classroom or it is in you know, the Zoom rooms that we spend our time in meetings in um, as we're constructing this college, um, the voices that resonate strongest for us are the voices of the students that we need to serve. And as long as we stay true to that and we continue to deliver results in the way that we have been um, and trending in that direction, uh, the, the longer that we will uh, be around. And, and that's to say, it, you know, Jim is absolutely right. You know, we had a, a rocky start, much like many other startups do, and we had to do it in the, in the public eye uh, under a tremendous amount of scrutiny. And you know, coming out of the other end of that, and during the, the height of the pandemic, and coming out of the other end of that, you know, we got to a point where, in a single year, we were able to go from under 500 enrollments to 1,300 enrollments to where we are today. This spring, we issued our 100th certificate of completion, and not only did we do that, when we look at the first quarter of this fiscal year, what we see is a, an increasing cadence with which we're seeing folks complete our program. So we know not only are we growing but we are also growing in the right direction. We're also trending higher on the outcomes that we're delivering, and we're doing it in a way that hasn't um, shortchanged equity. What we saw in the last pandemic, or not pandemic, the last uh, economic recovery um, was uh, a lot of folks who were entering our institutions and completing actually were better off than students might have been prior to that period of time, right? There was almost a, a crowding out of opportunity in higher education, especially in open access institutions. Um, with folks who may have had other points of entry into higher education. What we find now is that um, we are able to kind of maintain the, the focus of the populations that we were designed to serve, effectively reaching you know, over 90% of our students who are 25 years and older, 70% of our students who are BIPOC. You know, a third of our students are parent learners. That's three times the, the system rate of things. Um, so uh, we feel fairly confident uh, about the, the demonstration of progress that, that we have made so far. And the thing that I, I keep reminding people is, you know, this is in less than three years since having our first enrollments. And um, there's very few models of higher education that we remember that are built from the ground up. Um, but if we benchmark to those institutions like your Western Governors Institutions and some of these other more innovative entities, um, you can see that we're actually uh, aligning in terms of and exceeding some of the progress that they made in the year, early years as well. So I, I think all of that information is, is a strong body of evidence to talk about um, you know, what progress the college has made. But I think that the most, most important thing that I can say is that you know, we were six months ago a different institution than we are today. And six months from now, you're gonna see us even be uh, better because the cliff on improvement for us rocks at a much more, pass, much more rapid pace than it does for most traditional institutions. Hopefully those future bills won't even get a committee hearing and on, on we go. So uh, Eloy, you mentioned that the, uh, the decline in enrollment wasn't just a California situation, it was national. And both of you have a uh, you know, terrific background in education from a, a national uh, perspective. So, you know, I'm wondering about, you know, we who, who think about how California fares uh, every day and, you know, we know we have some incredible assets and amazing people and institutions, but at the same time, we wonder, you know, are we being competitive? Are we, uh, 
uh, you know, grabbing at or ignoring best practices? How are how are we faring, you know, compared to the folks in the nation? A few years ago, I served on a panel uh, at one of the local community colleges here to pick a chancellor, and it was interesting to look at all the candidate resumes. And there were some really interesting things coming out from you know folks who were running universities around the country that were a little sounded a little different. And then in the end, we we selected a person from here. Um, so I you know, never really got to see what it might have looked like had we imported someone from Western Pennsylvania who was doing things with business, the likes of which I you know, didn't normally see as much in the Bay Area. But how, how do we stand up uh, from a higher education perspective against the, the rest of the country? I'll, I'll put this to both of you. So I'd say this, on the plus side, we are one of the few states that's actually invested in higher education um, and historic levels. That's great. I mean, we had a big hole to dig out of from California, but we are one of the only states. And I think that's uh, uh, something that the governor should, um, you know, talk about as he has been talking about it. Um, we have the, the greatest public access in the country, which is great, you know, between the community colleges, the CSU and the University of California. We have the most comprehensive system of higher education, public higher education in the country. And couple that with our um, uh, private nonprofits, uh, we have tremendous scale in California. That's the good news. Um, the challenging news is we, we are in a very complicated state. Um, it takes a lot to move these ships that we call the three systems, um, but it's moving. Um, uh, I think places like, you know, I don't normally pick out Indiana as a place of innovation, but, you know, they invested tremendously in their um, technical college system, which is now producing great results because they're solely focused on job outcomes. Um, we need more of that. Um, uh, now, Indiana doesn't have what we have, which is why we live here and we don't live in Indiana. But, um, but nonetheless, um, I do think that um, uh, we have to demand more of our public systems. We have to demand more innovation. I think it's great that Arizona State University is setting up shop in LA. I think it pushes us to be better, pushes us to be more innovative. Look, we went completely online, all three systems overnight, and we succeeded. There is no reason why we should retreat from that. We should, um, places like the University of California, especially, need to be pushed to maintain that access because it's too easy to go back to our former shelters, continue to keep students out, uh, and, and we need the opposite in California. Th thanks, appreciate the perspective. Also reflecting on something you said earlier, you know, I had a really different experience with the failure of the Dodgers pitching. Um, I felt pretty, you know, pretty okay about what happened there. So, but Remember, maybe- Remember, you, you inherited our front office. So yeah, <laughs> this is true. Uh, Ajita, how about, what's your, what's your perspective on that? How does California stand up uh, nationally? Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things of California is not, just like Eloise said, the, the scale, um, but it is that there's actually tremendous pockets of amazing things going on throughout the state. And the challenge here in California is, can we scale those things, right? Can we change the way we do business? Because the assets we have here, the intellectual capital that we have here, the, the employers that we have here, you know, all of that is um, really conducive to, to doing more incredible things. And the, the question for, for me in terms of what California needs to, to lead in the way that I believe it should, uh, being the largest state in the union and being responsible for so much of our economy, um, it is really to, to find new ways of lifting up those good things that are happening in, in altering or breaking the right China in order to allow for us uh, to scale those activities. Um, so we can't use the old ways of doing business to try to achieve something different in terms of the outcome. Um, so, you know, I, I'm obviously gonna talk a lot about Calbright, but the point of Calbright was not just to be a, a standalone institution that did this great thing uh, for a group of, uh, of Californians. It was actually uh, as envisioned a way for us to think about what uh, could we 
have if we had an engine of innovation, an engine of best practices development, all focused around areas where we were facing challenges as higher education institutions in the state. And so um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here in California, different than might exist in other states, to really offer that up, right? The real R&D innovation capacities that exist and we're known for in California, um, how do we apply that in, in higher ed and in ways that are meaningful and how do we use what we're learning here at Calbright uh, to, to share with the rest of the system. That's a core part of why we exist um, and, and why uh, and what we hope to, uh, to continue to contribute as we grow and develop. Thank you, it's interesting. Um, so we, you know, we have this unusual economy, it's an understatement, in which you know, we have the lowest unemployment numbers in, in modern history, virtually kind of zero unemployment for the country, certainly for this region. And yet we've got a whole slew of people sitting on the sidelines outside of the labor market uh, and not trying to work their way, apparently not trying to work their way back in. So it, it seems like there's a real necessity, you know, to reach that population with, you know, by either reskilling or upskilling those folks for jobs that either are here or are coming. You know, I'll give as an example the recently passed uh, federal uh, chips legislation. So, you know, we want to onshore our chip uh, research, certainly, and manufacture. And uh, groups like ours, you know, we're, we're pushing for this. Um, we're concerned about California's ability to attract those uh, institutions to come here versus other states because we see them going to other states. And uh, part of that is the difficulty, you, you know, mentioned moving the three big dinosaurs of the education institutions, but we've got land use controls and you know, all kinds of restrictions that make creating employment in California diff difficult, but it's also a matter of, you know, probably more important than anything, is a company seeing <clears throat> the ability to either have a trained or trainable workforce. So do we have the capacity or the ingenuity or the will to, you know, reach those, I'll start with you, Ajita, and, and, and then Eloy, to, to reach that population and move the needle on this? Yes, we absolutely do, um, and uh, we have to. <laughs> um, you know, I'll actually maybe illustrate with a little bit of a, a, a case in point in terms of a, a new program we designed and kind of what we thought about when we were deciding what programs to offer and um, how we would approach this question or problem that gets at this, this um, you know, the, the sort of juggernaut in terms of how training traditionally occurs. Like we do a lot of training that's, quote, vocational, which is, non sequitur and you know singularly focused on a single job. And it's not the way the economy works and it's not the way the skills currency in the economy works, right? We, we, do, we do that or we ask people to get a four-year degree and um, two-year to a four-year degree in, in the case of California where there's much more integration in the system than there might be in other states. Um, so we set this as the, the benchmark of how we should um, uh, design programs. And so everything that's in the composition of what our institution do is based on um, the type of credential, you know, short-term, vocational, degree granting, those kinds of things. And it's also based on uh, sectors, right, disciplinary areas. And um, what's interesting, even when you get into vocational training, is when we start to push towards alignment, we really focus on that sector-based alignment, right? How do we train for X thing in X industry? And what we are starting to look through is actually what runs laterally across like what is that through line across other industries because how do we give people the greatest range of motion with which whatever learning or skills building they're doing to have the most set of opportunities in uh, in the job market and, and particularly what we've discovered is it has to do with how we view entry points into the knowledge economy for this sub degree population of learners that we're focused on so in designing a, a program what we started looking at was who's displaced in the economy during the time of, uh, of the pandemic. And it was frontline restaurant workers and it was hospitality workers and it was folks with deep customer experience, customer service experience. And what we discovered was an avenue open to them was what if they could apply those skills that they have with some technical training to be able to succeed in a new area that was cutting across all industries. And that was a, a CRM program, a CRM admin program that we created and it, using a Salesforce certification. And the reason that we chose that was because with that single certificate, we could see a set of skills, not only just associated with that job role, 
but a real quick uh, movement into other job categories and classifications, clusters of skills that are not just needed in the technology industry, quote unquote, but are needed across any industry that has an interaction with other businesses or directly to consumers. Um, and we have to, to begin to think more in that way when we think about the types of training, certification, skills, opportunities uh, that we offer. And we have to think about who is receiving that signal or that information. So we have to think about the hiring market as well and the behaviors of the hiring market, which uh, can be suboptimal, right? We wanna move into this incredible space of skills-based hiring, but we're not quite there yet, right? We're not in the post-credential world yet. So how do we bridge that gap to really make sure that there is value to what we're offering in the certification. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of our time actually designing and thinking about those kinds of through lines when we think about the types of programs we're gonna offer, where we're gonna grow programs and how we are gonna sort of meet this challenge of the type of scaled workforce uh, that comes out with the right set of skills to be attractive to industry and employers that the state and, lo and, and regional economic development um, uh, groups are, are trying to. So uh, that's really great, great explanation and hopeful. And, and Eloy, so taking off on what Ajita said, and you know, the, the, uh, the issue that we find representing the employer community uh, is you know, what we know is a lot of our members especially the bigger ones, but smaller ones too, they're actually the ones providing the training for their workforce. They say, you know, somebody, gradu you know, somebody graduates, they don't have the skills we need, so we need to provide the training. So we, we know that's true. You know, how do we, uh, you know, how do we deal with, make, take advantage of, you know, the, the willingness on the part of employers to train and the capabilities of the public education system to provide the training and provide the support. You know, how are we doing and how can we do? So a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, the higher education system should not be the individual training site for an employer. That's always been the employer's role. It was the employer's role before, should continue to be the employer's role, a specific job training uh, criteria, what we need to do is better translate the kinds of skills that allow a person to be successful in that environment and better articulate them. It goes back to what Ajita was saying. There's, there's a lot of work being done right now around skills and competencies, um, breaking down um, job descriptions into skills and competencies, and then breaking down curriculum certificates, degrees into skills and competencies. And, and using technology to drive that match a lot better than we, what we do now. Once we can crack that, we can begin to do a much better job of matching skills and competencies, job openings that are already being created. And if you think about it, we can pre-populate those jobs while students are still in, in, in school. Um, so that's where we need to drive toward. Um, and away from this thinking that what we need are the, the more blunt instruments, degrees. Um, uh, yes, we want students to continue to pursue degrees because that's, we know based on data that that's better for them throughout their lifetime. But in the meantime, we want them to have economic mobility and we want employers to be able to match to skills and competencies. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, particularly adult working learners, they come with a whole set of skills and competencies that are not captured in a transcript. And we need to do a better job of that. I mean, I'm former military. When I came out of the military, none of my experience mattered to my higher education institution. Uh, but those are skills, and we need to do a better job of translating them, articulating them, and then com communicating them to employers. And, and employers need to come along as well. Um, I mean, there's still this bifurcation. Um, they fill top level positions based on pedigree and, and now they want the lower level positions filled based on competency. We can't have it both ways. Great, thank you. So last question for me and then I'd like to open it up to you uh, and uh, folks who are uh, watching and enjoying this uh, really good conversation is on, you, you both came out of the, uh, spent time with the government, uh, federal government, state government, 
Uh, what, can our, what can they be doing uh, to help uh, make this all more effective? What, what, what are they doing and what, what should they be doing? Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, I think in particular right now, there is such a focus on um, student debt and um, the consumer protection side of higher education. And it's, it's an absolute necessity, um, but it is necessary but insufficient for what we need to create as the conditions in which more institutions feel the incentive and the freedom to do more innovative things and try new ways and new models of doing things. And that is both seeded in this investment, but it is also an understanding that the current regulatory structures don't often support competency-based education because everything in terms of the way that uh, programs and colleges are funded have to do with inputs, you know, time spent in the classroom, not the outcomes necessarily, which is the demonstration of skills mastered. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's a, a lot of great work ahead of us in terms of what is federally focused on and also what we focus on here in the state to really align the financing model and the incentive model to what we are asking uh, institutions to do. Because otherwise institutions will find ways to do it in narrow pockets because they're scrappy, especially community college leaders. Um, but it will be very difficult for them to do that in a way that is scalable and reaches all of the students that it needs to reach. Um, so I would say those are, those are two primary areas and, and a related one that Eloy talked about, which is related to the validation of learning. There's a fundamental shift when you move towards skill-based credentialing that has everything to do with the fact that you are disrupting a very sacred cow. And I can say that because I'm Hindu. Um, and that, and that is the fact that we have always viewed higher education as the source of expertise dispensed to other individuals. We have not acknowledged that in this changing environment, especially with populations of learners that come to us with assets, with capacities, with full capabilities and skills already, um, but for the fact that we haven't found a way to validate that learning in a way that saves them time and opportunity cost in actually getting the credential they need that signals to the employer that they in fact have those skills. So I, I think there is there are some, some very great work ahead of us, but this requires coordinated uh, effort from the part of the state and also from the part of the federal government. That's, uh, that's really great. I don't know everything that you said, but when it comes to needing validation, I know that I can relate, I can re relate to that. Um, so Eloy, what do you think? If you had one wish that you could get from uh, President Biden, for uh, to support higher ed, what would it be? What would it be? It's a, um, a, a way to support um, innovation between public and private sector in, in more and better ways than we do now. Um, I think there's a big push in Congress right now for short-term Pells, for more innovation, for more clear links from post-secondary education to employment, that we need the federal government to come behind that and find ways to support states to make that happen locally. Um, we have, um, we do a terrible job of innovating in the public sector because we don't like failure in the public sector. We think failure is a horrible thing. We think, um, taking Calbright for an example, I mean, I had no gray hair before Calbright. But, um, you know, you make a mistake in Silicon Valley and, you know, you just keep pushing forward. You make a mistake in the public sector, particularly public higher education, and they try to kill you, bury you, and pour cement over you. Um, and so we, we've got to change that mindset. How does that work in the military? <laughs> I'm just curious. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Yeah, ask, you ask Darwin. Would. Actually, ask Darwin. Right? Absolutely, it works. Uh, one quick last question, foreign students. So in the pandemic, we saw a pretty significant drop in foreign student applications and acceptance. You know, is that provide more space for uh, students from, from California or the US or is it reducing the experience that our students are getting in their education? Well, um, so I think you know, part of part of the narrative right now is a red herring. Um, uh, I mean, 
yes, we probably went overboard for a period of time with how much foreign students we were seeking. And that was because places like Berkeley, UCLA, and San Diego needed the revenue in order to pay for the lack of revenue that they were getting from the state of California. So it went overboard and particularly on the issue of, of Chinese students, I think we, we got in a real pickle, but we do need foreign students. Um, I mean, this is California, we should be attracting foreign students. So I don't think that the two are connected. I think we have plenty of room for local Californians. I think we need to continue to push for greater capacity in our systems and greater capacity without growing the footprint of our systems. Uh, we can grow capacity um, through more hybrid approaches, through more online approaches, through more partnerships. Um, building more footprint is not the answer for California. Thanks. Ajita? I don't have anything to add to that. I think that's... Uh, he he, he nice. got it. Okay, good. Let, look, thank you very much. This is great. And I promised the uh, audience a chance to ask questions. So we have a mic. I think we have a mic back there, right, Rupa? So... Go ahead. Uh, we have one from Ms. Ms. Wei Bing in the front row. Hi, firstly, thank you for the very um, interesting conversation. So I uh, asked two questions, both from uh, as a parent of a college kid and also being on the UK University Advisory Board for six years. Where I was. Um, so the cost of higher education in this area is not low. So I observe other parents send their children to UK or Canada, that's cost, or Germany and France, which is free. So how do we remain our California university competitive? And also US-China relationship pickle makes a lot of Chinese students internationally going to Europe as well. So that's question one. And question two is about meritocracy versus diversity. Probably you heard a case, Harvard case 2015 about Asian Americans being you know, suppressed. So I want to see how California look into meritocracy versus diversity in your enrollment and student population. That's it. Well, I'll, I'll weigh into the second question, and I'm and you know forgive me if I upset you, but uh, I, I there there is th this argument over meritocracy is is a total red herring. Um, it it is um, an, an attempt to divide communities of color, to divide black. Uh, brown and Asian communities, and to pretend like, you know, the pie is fixed at the University of California, because this is where it happens primarily, um, and, and that we shouldn't be talking about expanding access. So that's, that's where we get into the hangup. I mean, we, we, we've had conversations around this when we abolished the, the SAT. Um, what, what we're all hoping for is to give, it is, is equality not equal, but equity. And that is giving different people similar opportunities in order to obtain access um, uh, to, to our, our best institutions. That shouldn't mean keeping somebody out. That should mean opening the door to as many people as we can. Um, the problem we're in now is we define it as a zero sum game. And then so one community feels like they are being shut out if we let more of another community in. So I believe every student, black, brown, uh, Asian, white, whatever, who gets into the University of California, achieve that on their own merit. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we've gotten in this position in California that we have to have this conversation about one versus the other. Diversity is good for California. Uh, diversity doesn't reduce academic quality. We need to do a better job of admitting more Californians. Thank you. Ajita, you want to touch that one or the issue around pricing? I will make the, the pricing question because I think uh, oftentimes there's a strong desire to analogize the American higher education system to other systems. And the big differentiating factor is actually that a lot of those other countries have a centralized ministry of education or an ability to actually control both supply and price. And we actually do not enjoy that ability. So all of the things that we do uh, and, and take action around have an impact to the way that the market works. And, and by that, I mean, you know, when we saw tuition increase in public sector institutions corresponding to a decline in state investment, right? That was the cause of tuition increases. It wasn't because um, public institutions were price gouging individual consumers. 
It's similarly true, we, we uh, look at the relationship between debt financing and the growth in debt financing, particularly in programs like graduate programs, and not necessarily in undergraduate programs because the availability of aid is fixed and the market is adjusted. So I, I think there's, a, there's some real big differences in terms of the tools and resources that, that we have as uh, policymakers to influence affordability in, in the country. And, and that's why we find ourselves in these conundrum of uh, you know, post facto debt cancellation conversations versus uh, frontline conversations about the, the pricing and the cost for students of, of higher education. Um, that being said, I also think that some of this is, is healthy and allowed for American institutions to continue to lead in terms of their research mission and objectives and their contribution to the overall economy. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes forget that, that all levels of our public higher education institutions con contribute in calculable, uh, important ways to our economies and to the democratic fabric of what we do as a country. And so I, uh, I think there is a lot to celebrate about it. Unfortunately, this, this question around cost and availability has to push us into a conversation where we're talking about outcomes. And, and we're seeing that because consumers are forcing us to see that, right? Prospective students are weighing decisions of whether to go and where to go based on finance considerations and concerns over student debt in the long run. So I think we will see that correction happen, um, but I think it will take some time given the fact that there's not a direct intervention on our part. Um, the last thing, if I could just take a, just a two seconds to, to yes and uh, on, on Eloy's comments around the way that we look at, uh, quote, the American meritocracy in the admissions process. I think it is, uh, you know, I don't hang out in the four-year market anymore, but uh, one thing that I do think is important to, to point out is uh, this idea and assumption that what we have done to date has been somehow equitable and, merit, and filled with merit. Um, is, the, is the biggest assumption that we have to crack open. There are a lot of different considerations that colleges have in a black box admissions process. Uh, and if we don't acknowledge that, it allows us to be hoodwinked a little bit in terms of the assumptions that we den gen generate about why different people or communities get into institutions and why others don't. And overall, this has more to do with the fact that there has always been a race towards prestige for a very select number of institutions that make it into the US News and World Report rankings, but not where the majority of our country is educated. And so I, I also just want to point out that we can, we can have a conversation about highly selective institutions and, and some of the, the variation in, in admissions policies that make it profoundly unequitable for reasons that seem inexplicable. Um, but we really should focus the conversation on who are, in, who are the institutions that are serving the bulk of uh, Americans in this country um, and, and how are we uh, looking at their access points, what they're doing, what the kind of investment that they need to have in those institutions. Right, thank you. Case, Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn and the great Community. San Francisco State University right here in this great city. So. A lot of us get a, a pretty good education in universities that you know don't uh, get that kind of attention. And it's it's uh, with with one kid in community college now and another one who's a senior in high school. And thinking you know being on this conversation all the time, it's it's really interesting to see sort of where their heads heads go and and versus the reality. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Um I want to move a little bit upstream, and I think this is what you were getting at on the meritocracy issue, because that assumes application. That, that means someone who's actually applied, and that's when the, those value judgments and, and are, are made. Before that is the real access yeah. to college, um, which is, is it for me? Do I even apply? Does the college know I exist because I live outside of a hot zip code or a community, uh, 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 an area that has traditionally sent 47% of their high school seniors onto college? And then, even more complicated in the adult space, for which there are no real um, uh, methods in which to identify adults who want to learn. So that's a statement and it's gonna lead to a question with one more piece of information. We do surveys across the country and we ask a question, 
do you intend to enroll in education or training in the next two years? 40% of Hispanics say yes to that question. 39% of African Americans say yes to that question. 37% of Asians say yes to that question. 16% of whites say yes to that question. And yet they're the ones who are getting the outreach from the, from the universities. They're the ones who've grown up believing that the system was for them. So how do we change the mindset of colleges about who the new students should be, not just who's showing up, but who should they be? Who are the people who actually want it and need because they miss it the first time or they failed the first time, but they still have the desire to get that education to better their lives? So, I mean, there's several pieces to that answer. I mean, one just off the top of my head is, um, you know, families who have not participated in higher education drill into their children that this is your way out of the situation you find yourself. So there is this push, particularly in Hispanic communities. Um, but this is, the, this is the trap of first generation students. They aspire, but the network isn't there. The outreach isn't there. Look, I grew up in the shadow of USC and UCLA. Um, I had no idea how to even navigate that process. Um, I watched a lot of football on TV, <laughs> but um, but I didn't know how to apply. I didn't know. I mean, they never called me. Um, so so that is a fundamental shift that's happening now. I think you know we have friends here from WGU. Some of the larger um, fully online colleges have forced us to rethink our models of how we reach students. Um, you know, uh, when I first started at, in the Biden administration, I saw a statistic that was about a one in 2019, 20, there was about a 1% increase in enrollments. But if you peeled out Western governors, Southern New Hampshire, the University of Maryland Global Campus and Purdue Global, there was about a 3% decline. And so what does that tell you? that they are presenting opportunities to students who didn't see themselves as going to college under a previous other, under the other model. So we're doing something different. We're actually creating schedules, opportunities that match people's ability to attend. And we need to do more of that. We need, and we need to put more power in the hands, either through technology or through other means in the, power, in the hands of parents and students so that they can actually understand how to navigate and, and find themselves. I think this pilot that was just recently uh, launched, uh, the dual admissions pilot in the University of California and with the community colleges, I think is an excellent opportunity to read students who don't otherwise see themselves as being able to go to University of California campus. And we need to do more of that. Um, I'll actually take it to kind of the, what, we, what we've learned from the students that we're serving. And a large part of the challenge actually has been not just to folks not see themselves in a higher education opportunity. Often they have had a trauma with the educational system. So maybe they have gone to a predatory for-profit like a Corinthian college that closed on them and they were left you know, holding the bag or um, more likely earlier in their educational career, they have been told that they cannot, that they are less than, that they are not capable. And um, that is a, a different kind of conversation for a higher education institution to have with somebody because everybody comes to us with hope and aspiration and belief. And we just have to remind them that you can actually be at an institution that is rooting for you to succeed and that understands that your biggest challenge is actually not affordability according to our survey results, but actually accessibility. Can the model be flexible enough to meet with the life demands that I am faced with on a day-to-day -day basis when I am working, when I have an uncertain or unpredictable schedule, when I have adult caregiving responsibilities and childcare responsibilities, you know, how do I even make it to campus twice a week for a uh, four o'clock class? You know, either that's in the middle of the workday or I have pickup or, you know, these are, these are real, real things. And so, you know, one, I, I agree with you that the sorting hat gets put on extraordinarily early and we don't do a good job of understanding that folks have potential um, and when we should assess that potential in individuals. And then we forget how to have a conversation with people that looks at them as glass half full, right? We, to, that looks at them and says, you are fully capable you are in fact managing a very complex matrix of responsibilities and you are crushing it. 
Um, how do we make it possible for you to do the thing that you've always wanted to do, which is to achieve something greater and more stable? And, and you know, part of, part of that conversation that we have in recruiting students and in reaching out to communities um, is starting around that message, but then we have to have the follow through in the design of support and offerings that we have, right? It's not enough to enroll you in our institutions. That's how most institutions get paid, but we're really concerned and, and accountable for that outcome. And so, I, you know, I think this is a, it's, it's a great question and it's uh, one that has very little research and evidence base for how to do it effectively with the community of learners that we're talking about. Jill, I just wanted to interrupt quickly. You can hear the, the bell is tolling. Yeah, I hear the right bell. Um, we have another question in the audience. We have a couple online. Uh, can we say a couple? Uh, we started five minutes late, so can we run five minutes? Is that yeah, legal? Absolutely. So yeah, good afternoon. Rick Benbo, Western Governors University. Thanks so much for the dialogue, the rich conversation around how we need to innovate in the higher ed uh, space. Uh, I guess my question is more or less directed at reflecting back on a time when the three entities of government, industry, uh, and higher ed systems seem to be more coordinated in their effort and for the outcome of the student and the outcome of society. That was maybe 25, 30 years ago. Since that time, it seems like these three entities have maybe gone off in their own separate space and are more or less working in silos on their own individual metrics or goals. As we move or try to transition to a space where we are expanding the talent pool, creating different talent pipelines, creating the T-developed workforce, or even uh, expanding access. What can we do to bring these three entities back together for the good of the student, the good of student outcomes, and the good of society? Well, well first of all, I'd say um, it's plenty to be critical of California's higher education system, but we're the fifth largest economy in the world because of our public higher education system. So um, there is nothing like this in any other state in the country. And we ha always have to remember that as, as bad as we think it can get, um, you know, I met regularly with all the system heads of all the systems um, every month. Um, the governor convenes the group every month along with the California chamber, along with labor, so there is a lot happening. The challenge that we have is we need to better align the incentives in order to make sure that we're serving the majority of California. The incentive for the University of California are its, its research outcomes. That's the incentive, not undergraduate education. The incentive for CSU is undergraduate education, but you know they wanna be research universities. And for community colleges, we have a challenge in that we want them to accomplish four or five different sets of outcomes, um, and but we don't really understand how to measure them. And the main incentive for community colleges, in my opinion, should be economic mobility. Um, so the issue is for, for, for a state that is challenged by the way that it budgets, um, how do you create the right incentive structure to get the systems to work more closely it is and because of a lack of desire it's a lack of incentive i, I agree with that in terms of definitely the regulatory structure but i i'll shift the conversation to something i think we can do which is i think there has to be a tremendous push in the form of proofs of concepts so how do we continue to actually push for what we want and need as leading institutions that desire this alignment and that advocate for this alignment and you know i i love your team over at Western Governors University and, and um, you have a great president in, in Scott Pulsifer over there. And um, you know, one of the things I like about what Western Governors University does is their ability to engage at a high level with employers to really test out some of these things we're talking about in terms of the alignment that we wanna see that facilitates the kind of throughput into the economy that uh, our, our institutions want to see happen. And so, you know, I sort of, I guess I would issue as a challenge to the folks here and uh, in California to sort of say there are uh, more opportunities for us to collaborate and to align around different types of programs and demonstrations of what can be accomplished when we do those things well. And when we, and the only way to do those things well is together. So, we, you know, we think a lot about at Calbright about the way we engage with employers and industry. 
And we look for partners who are uh, really uh, aligned in terms of their values and objectives, right? I, I want to do, or I am leading in the skills-based hiring space. I need an equity pipeline into the industry or the, the um, uh, firm that I am, I am working for. And, um, you know, I, I will stake out opportunities for folks to, to, to access to that if I have the right educational partner who can deliver for me. So, I, you know, I think those are the kinds of ways in which the, the show of strength that gives the inertia to push against the, you know, the, 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 the framework, regulatory framework and incentive framework that we find ourselves in um, has to start with that. It has to start with more voices than just educational institutions who are the regulated entities advocating for it. Well, thanks. Uh, Rufus, how are we on? Uh, yeah, we have uh, a couple of questions from uh, online if we want to uh, take we'll have the to, record. Why don't we ask them quick and we'll answer them quick in order to try to get... Is that Light, okay? lightning, light, lightning round here. That, then. Yeah, uh, this comes round. from uh, Lauren Asher. Where are the main opportunities and the main risks with the growing demand from policymakers and students uh, for short-term credentials? The opportunity is that's what the market is demanding and that's a great opportunity for students who don't otherwise have access to a longer term higher education. The, the downside is, uh, well, the challenge is making sure that they connect to a longer term degree so that we don't leave them in a terminal situation where they have nowhere to go. Great, uh, and then one from Carrie Portis, this is our last from online that I'm aware of. Uh, where does mindset fit in? Um, how can post-secondary institutions help build confidence address imposter syndrome and address other barriers that impact students' beliefs. And I maybe kind of alluded to that in their earlier question that we had about uh, kind of, uh, what, what, who, who thinks they belong where. Yeah, I think it's everything to do with the nature of how we design our services, support and intervention. Uh, everything in terms of that full experience of somebody from the time we reach them at the institution to the time that they leave our institution is uh, something that we try to, to curate and we try to, to communicate and to connect with learners and build that relationship early in that process so that we're not responding to them when they're already struggling. We're reaching out to them and encouraging them and they know that, they're, that we are there for them before they run into trouble because then they're more likely to engage when that, when that challenge or trouble occurs that might have them otherwise falling out. And so uh, I think you know, part of the mindset is to understand that there are a team of people that are rooting for you to succeed um, and then having that be regularly validated, right? In the interactions that counselors or student support specialists are having with our students. My quick answer is diversify the classroom and the mindset will change. Love it. You know, um, you guys are great and we are so fortunate to have you in the fray, uh, working on our collective behalf to you know, ensure that the institutions that we're gonna rely on as a society are going to flourish and you know, our kids, you know, the next generation of kids are gonna have the kind of opportunities that they need to have and deserve to have all kids. And so you know, I, th I think generally speaking, my observation is things are looking up. We learned a lot made some mistakes, actually did make some mistakes. And we, you know, you learn from those things. And um, I'm excited for the Bay Area Council, which is a major connecting point between the, you know, the institutions that, that teach and, and train and the institutions that hire and develop. Um, you know, we, we sort of sit in the middle of that. So it's an exciting place to be at a time when, it's, I think it's gonna be pretty important in the next few years, you know, where we go from here because we're going to fit, you know, we're facing certain challenges and we'll face others, but there's a real, I think there's some real upside ahead for us if we all kind of really get down and understand what we're doing and do the job. So I want to thank you for coming today. This isn't, uh, won't be the last time, it isn't the first, it won't be the last time we'll have these uh, discussions. And for all of you who are either here on the Klamath or in the uh, in, the, in our virtual audience, you know, get involved uh, with the Bay Area Council or with these organizations. Uh, you know, your interest is and in activity is really important. I want to thank uh, Joel and Cameron and Rufus for uh, you know putting on the, this today because the technical aspects of doing this are, you know, they're pretty they're pretty interesting. As the chair of the region's ferry system, I'm always really excited to see ferries. So a lot of them came by. But then every time they came by, we got all shook up. So as the sort of 
person who operates the Klamath. I don't know about these ferries. So I'm, I'm very conflicted about this situation, but we'll have to work on that in another environment. Thanks everybody for coming. Tour the boat. Check it out. Make sure, uh, make sure you get up to the rooftop, the beautiful view. <laughs>